Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Six days after Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John to lead them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elisha talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The problem is the Romans. The, the problem is the Romans. In today's Gospel, we hear one of the most enigmatic and one of the most fascinating stories found in the Bible. While Jesus, Peter, James, and John gather on the top of a mountain, something unique happens. The scripture says, and he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. <clears throat> Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking to him. In today's Gospel, we hear about the transfiguration of Jesus and this weird and, and yet interesting gathering an interaction between two of the most important prophets of the Jewish uh, culture, Jewish faith, Moses and Elijah. Let me just say that all this takes place because of the Romans. Let me explain. Close your eyes for a second and imagine that you and I travel back in time to the year 25 AD. We go across the Pacific Ocean and we find ourselves in the land of Israel. All right, open your eyes. And remember, we are no longer in Beaverdam. We are not longer Wisconsinites. We are Israelites. 
and we are in the midst of Israel. Now take a good look around the room. Look at the people who are sitting down around you. Amongst ourselves, we have farmers, we have carpenters, we have fishermen. Some of us work in construction, maybe one or two of us are tax collectors, and perhaps we have a few synagogue priests amongst ourselves, but we are the people of Israel. Now, in our neck of the woods, life is great. We have our God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. We have our laws, religious laws that, was, that were given to us by Moses, the prophet. And, and we have one another. Now, at the same time, we have amongst ourselves a group of people called the Romans. And the word on the street says that these people are part of a huge empire who is led by a man known as Caesar, also known as the King and the Lord. In fact, there are a few Romans, many of them actually, that refer to this Caesar as the Savior and the Son of God. Now, to us Israelites, such titles are blasphemy. They are lies because the only person who should carry such titles is the Messiah. And between you and I, this Caesar, he, he's not the Messiah. He is not it. But we can say much about it. We cannot disagree with the Roman law because... The Romans have a powerful army and many have been persecuted and even killed when questioned the authority of Caesar. So this is the land that we live in, a land in which we have our God, we have our religious law, and yet a land in which we are enslaved by an empire, an empire that demanded us to be faithful to them, to follow their commandments and law in exchange of peace and security. How would you feel living in such a place? Hard, right? Now let's go back to Wisconsin. Whew, we're in a better place now. In the time of Jesus, Israel was heavily influenced and controlled by the law of the Roman Empire. In fact, there are many authors, many theologians, many writers that state that the movement that Jesus began among his people was a movement that contradicted and even challenged the violent, the corrupt, and the evil message that was carried and preached by the emperor and the Roman Empire. Jesus and his teachings were literally an antithesis of the Roman Empire. Now, one of those people who spoke heavily against the message that was preached by Rome was the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Take, for instance, today's reading from the Gospel. As we look at the passage, we find images and metaphors that speak of the contrast that existed between the law appointed by Caesar and the Romans and the message that was brought by Jesus. On the one hand, we have the Roman Empire who represents the evil in the world, uh, corruption, the violence, discrimination, oppression. On the other hand, we have Jesus who, for the past couple of weeks, has been preaching to his disciples and all of us about loving your neighbor and praying for your enemy, about blessing the poor, 
taking care of those who are in need and giving ourselves to the world as instruments of God. So, on one side we have the Romans who have a message that is just horrible, and on the other side we have Jesus preaching a message that contradicts and challenges that. Today, after Jesus preaches the Beatitudes, which we heard a couple of weeks ago, Jesus challenges the message of Rome. Jesus is transfigured and becomes light, bright as the sun. Now, this is an important image. It speaks of this divine identity that Jesus has, but also speaks of who is Jesus in this part of the world at this time. You know how in the movies, bad people, bad guys always, always wear black clothing or dark clothing? And how good people wear white or clear clothing? Same illustration. Jesus stands full of light, and with him stands two of the most important and two of the most promising and prominent prophets of Israel, Moses and Elisha. This image illustrates that Jesus is the light, not wrong. Jesus is. Now, let's take a few steps back and think about any story in the Bible that speaks about a prophet and a mountain. When you think about stories in the Bible that speak about a prophet and a mountain, what stories come to mind? Moses. Exactly. Among the many stories that should pop up on, in our heads, Moses and the tablets of the law should come to mind. In today's reading, Jesus is in a, in a mountain. And he is with Moses and Elisha. So in a way, Jesus is depicted as the new law given to the people by God. In fact, Peter, James, and John, while they see Jesus being transfigured, there is this huge voice from heaven saying, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to God's law, the true law, the law that stands for love, for forgiveness, the law that stands against Rome. So yes, the problem is the Romans. The problem is the system of oppression, of violence, of division and corruption. And yet, as God's people as the people of God face the empire, as they are suffering through this environment, God gave the people a new light, a new law that is focused in mutual love, a peace of God's divine grace. I think that beyond anything that we can find in this gospel, today's reading invite us Christians to stand up against any system of oppression, any system of violence, of division and corruption, and like Christ, follow him his example, we are invited to become a new light to the world, to be transfigured in a sense. This Wednesday, Christians all over the world will gather at their churches and in their faith communities of faith. And each one of us will receive the ashes on our foreheads. We will gather to remember that we are vulnerable. You and I are. That we are reminded that without God, life just doesn't have a purpose. So as you receive the ashes on your foreheads, as you take this time during Lent,
to pray, to meditate, to come closer to God, I would really like to encourage you to pay attention to those systems of oppression that exists in our lives, in our midst, in our communities. And as you listen to the suffering of God's people, remember that you are called to stand up against those systems of oppression and become a new light to the world, to God's people. Remember that that light of love is in you and you are to shine among the darkness. May God be our shelter through this time. May Christ take away our fears and may the Holy Spirit lead us in truth until the day's dawn and the morning star rises in our hearts. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.